Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming for on a Monday morning. I think you'll find this is going to be well worth the time. Uh, I'd like to introduce my good friend and colleague, Dr. Venkatesh. He heads the glaucoma section for all of Aravind. Uh, and, and he may go into a little bit of detail about how they all decide and get together. And, but, he, but he also runs the uh, Pondicherry version of uh, hot, which is this hospital right here. Uh, he'll give you some numbers about how many, um, do we, you gonna do the number of patients a little bit today too, or? So uh, what we think of as giving care is, and I think we do a good job of it too, but what, when you talk about teams that are changing the world, uh, th these, uh, it's really hard to beat the Arab centers. And Dr. Venkatesh is unbelievable teacher, and uh, as a host, you, you, there's, no be there's no better place to go than to Pondicherry or, or any of the Arab systems, but particularly. And I've loved to watch his surgery and uh, learn from his skill at, at multiple different types of, of uh, complex cataracts, complex glaucoma cases. And fortunately, we're, we're in the process of working out some pro projects that we're gonna do, because we would really wanna be, we wanna be their true partners in terms of an academic uh, setup and actually helpful. Um, and so I think you'll be fascinated to see. I hope you mentioned something about the Google thing, maybe a little bit about that, which is just a fascinating part of what, uh, what the capability of a center like this is. And um, also for those that don't know, uh, Dr. Sham here is from uh, Nepal, uh, Tilganga, and he's part of the glaucoma unit there and he will be spending three weeks with us, and we get to keep um, Venki for about two more days. So learn everything you guys can. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure being with you all. You know, it's been a long pending visit to Salt Lake, but I'm enjoying the visit starting from Saturday afternoon. <laughs> Alan, uh, we, we've still not figured out going around Alan, Alan Crandall's house now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I need to make another couple of visits to complete the tour, but, but it's so, so interesting, both the city and uh, uh, the kind of uh, warmthness which we get from the team here. So uh, this is something which, uh, which is close to our heart, but we didn't know how friendly we are to the environment, but we are trying to understand that better and better now. So I thought I will share with you, because there's a lot of interest from this side also to uh, kind of uh, uh, be environmental friendly by reducing waste or segregation of waste and things like that. So I choose this topic uh, for the presentation. Um, in fact, this is the second time I'm doing it. The first one was at Kellogg's uh, Grand Round. So it was specially prepared for this uh, particular session. And uh, I have, uh, uh, I'm not an expert in environment. No, I'm just an ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist, forced to now uh, uh, administrate a hospital in Pondicherry for the last uh, seven, eight years. But uh, I, I enjoy the work. And now we try to understand how uh, the three Ps, which the environment experts call. You now, when you are looking at people, you're looking at profits, to make profits you know, in the form of patients and our customers. And it's so important to look at the planet. So when you're looking at people and profit, I think planet is so important. But we also have to understand that when you look at the planet, profits will automatically come. The only thing we'll have to negotiate with uh, our own team, their mindset, and of course the regulations which you have around us. But uh, this, uh, this, uh, this presentation is just to kind of uh, see overview of what happens at Arvind. So there's a beautiful campus in Pondicherry which you can see like it's a 25 acre campus and uh, this building is 200,000 square feet and now almost 60% of elect electricity is generated from the solar panels. It's not like the sun here. You know, way back in south of India, 365 days you'll have sun. <laughs> Even in a peak monsoon, there'll be a couple of hours of rain and then you'll have sun. So you, you don't need a dryer at home. Mm -hmm. So you can always dry your clothes outside. So we can generate a pretty good uh, and you can see the uh, paddy fields right behind the campus. So we uh, grow our rice 
uh, wheat and everything there for our own garden, uh, I mean, for our own canteen and the, uh, co the condom where the uh, staff and uh, uh, students stay, they're running their canteen, everything is from, uh, most of the products are made here. And then you have a beautiful water recycling plant here, one of the biggest in Southeast Asia, decentralized wastewater treatment plant, DWATS. So basically it's got uh, organic, inorganic bacteria and it's totally chemical free uh, sewage treatment plant. So that filters around 300,000 liters of water daily. So 90% of water we use is reused again for gardening and taking care of this uh, uh, agricultural part of the uh, campus. Uh, how many of you are aware, aware of this overshoot day here? Yeah. Like what is the environmental resource we have for that particular year? year? and how much we are, what is the period we exhaust that is called the World Overshoot Day. So environment experts, they make this for every year. And depending on the previous year's experience, you now they come up with an overshoot day for each and every country. I don't know where uh, India is, but, uh, but I'm sure we can see where US is. So rest of the months, you now we are using the resources which is there for for the next years or the next generations. So if you take globally, I think it's August 1st, 2008. And this, over the years, no, it's, it's, it's kind of from being February to now August. So we are depleting all these natural resources to take care of ourselves. So this is what now environmental experts are worried about. Why are we getting cyclones? Why are we getting tsunamis? unusual rainfalls, which they say once, we've never seen this in the last 100 years, in the last 150 years. So we had a, uh, one of the worst uh, uh, cyclone and uh, flood, flooding in our neighboring state, Kerala, a couple of weeks back. Almost 200 to 300 people lost their lives, several people lost their livelihood, and it is one of the most popular tourist destination in the country, God's own country, Kerala. I don't think they can get tourists for the next two years. It's so badly damaged. So that is what is happening across the globe. You know, every other day we hear about tsunamis in Indonesia. So somewhere all these are related to how we are friendly to the environmental. So these are the SDGs which are going to transform our goals, the sustainable development goals. And of which the 11 and 12 are very important you know, for healthcare and anybody working in our area. Sustainable <coughs> cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, and climate action. So these are some of the important things where we have some control over it. If you see this publication in Lancet, it says climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century. And where is the opportunity for that? <clears throat> I think the opportunity is with us. Tackling the climate change could be the greatest global health opportunity of the 21st century. Both are on the Lancet front pages. <clears throat> so we need to see how we can be friendly. So these are all the WHO guidelines for healthy hospitals, a healthy planet, and for healthy people. So if you, if you see, number one will be energy efficiency, how efficient we are going to be in using energy. Green building designs, you know, where you can bring in a lot of uh, daylight and air condition only where it is required alternate energy generation, getting solar, windmill, and all the other ways of generating. Transportation, which is very important. A lot of times, people don't show any interest on this. No, how are you getting your customers, or patients inside into the system? How are we getting our staff into the system? It's so important. You know? When uh, Jeff Tabin travels all the way from, where is that? Stanford, yeah. No, now, uh, when he was here in Salt Lake, oh. on the way to Park City, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. no, when you're coming all the way from there, you know, we have to see how much of carbon footprint we generate. No, all these are very important. You're coming five days a week. Morning, once, evening, again, we are going back. So there is a lot of uh, uh, carbon footprint related to transportation, food, water, and also you know, how do we conserve, uh, uh, and more importantly, how do we uh, kind of work with our waste. 
So the the three P model, which I was just telling you, the the social impact uh, which Arvind was doing over the years, you know, reaching the unreached, getting the people who cannot be assessed, uh, uh, meeting uh, people who are in the bottom of pyramid. So we were thinking, uh, no, we were kind of doing a social impact. But over the years, we found that by doing a social impact, we were able to make profits. You know, with our 30 to 40 percent paying patients, we were able to sustain 50 to 60 percent of totally free or steeply subsidized charges for another group of patients who can't afford services. And we were reaching them. It's not that the patients were coming inside to a facility. We were going and finding them through outreach, through vision centers. But now we understand that we are also friendly to the environment. So, so that is where I think uh, sustainable care delivery comes into place. This is just to show you an article which was published in 2013 in Journal of Eye, where they calculated the carbon footprint of doing one phacoemulsification. And we have to extrapolate this to the number of phacoemulsifications <coughs> we do across the globe. And it can change from developed world to the developing world. But again, the point to understand is a single FACO emits 180 kilogram of carbon equivalent. And this equivalent of driving a car 500 kilometers. Okay, So that is one FACO waste which we generate. And over 50% of these greenhouse gas emissions originate from procurement of supplies. No, you we just open a packet. But for the packet to come inside into our system, for the packet to be manufactured, there's so much of energy efficiency and a lot of things which are being used. <coughs> and usually the supplies nowadays are largely single use disposables. So if you just see this break, procurement is fifty three point eight percent, building and energy use is thirty six point one percent, and travel would be another. 10%. So ophthalmology is one of the real high volume outpatient specialties. That's why every institute has got a separate ophthalmic center or an eye center separately. I believe you are also running a part of an, a, a, the main hospital or the children's hospital. But if you go across uh, US now, every eye center is a different building. Maybe Iowa, Wilmer, uh, <coughs> Wills Eye Institute. Because there's so much of people who are coming into the system, and most of the procedures are, again, daycare procedures where they come and leave. They don't have to stay with us. And it's got a high surgical throughput. And uh, cataract surgery is the uh, commonest. It's almost 80 or 90 percent of our procedures are cataract surgeries with high disposable supplies and material components. This is just to give you a global uh, overview of how many million surgeries we perform. 26 million surgeries in 2017. This is almost <coughs> near accurate data. And the procedure volume is growing at 3.1% per year. So 2018, we'll be doing another 3.1% more than the 26 million. Because we know the need for cataract is changing. <coughs> From somebody who had cataract, now to somebody for a need. It's a clear lens extraction for a narrow angle, or maybe a clear lens extraction because just because he walked into a eye facility. That's happening. So there was an editorial sometime back in uh, uh, BJO, no? and uh, it writes about cataract surgery in India. Cataract surgery in India, because cataract is a malignant disease. If you don't operate, it will metastasize to the neighboring clinic. <laughs> so so that's, the, that's the kind of problem we see in, in some of the urban centers. And we know most of the procedures are FACO emulsification, almost two-thirds in the globe. But the one-third, again, of uh, developing world, we do more of small incision than FACO. This is just to give you an overview of uh, Aravind in uh, uh, South India. You can't, now we are just moving into a little bit into South India with our seventh tertiary care center, which is going to be started somewhere here in Andhra Pradesh, the neighboring state where they speak Telugu. And we have all been in a place where they speak Tamil, or Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. And we have six tertiary care centers now, six secondary care centers, six outpatient centers. These outpatient centers are mainly doing follow-up. They don't do surgery, 
they just do follow up but there is a doctor available to see uh, post ops and also uh, glaucoma reviews and dr reviews and we have this 67 primary eye care centers which are already 71 and 72 yesterday we had the 72nd center but as i'm just showing your data for 67 i just have 67 here and it serves a population of 80 million so this is what happens in a year and uh, for the last few years we are close seeing close to 4 million outpatients and we are doing close to 500,000 procedures 300,000 cataracts and 178,000 other procedures specialty procedures lasers and injections and if you see almost 51% is paying now and 49% is free and subsidized the paying volume is gradually increasing even after i started my career in arvind when i was a resident in 94 it was less than 25% and now the paying patients is almost 50% it's crossed 51 last year for the first time for simple reasons india is developing and the other important reason even the people below poverty line now are insured by the government of tamil nadu and this scheme is very popular scheme and now uh, our uh, prime minister narendra modi has made it a national scheme called modi care so there are people below poverty line almost 60 million people below <coughs> poverty line are given 400000 indian rupees for 4 years to take care of something which is life saving and eye saving so many of the people who can't pay for the treatment who are going to our free hospital now have a smart card and uh, your money is processed by an insurance company and within a couple of weeks we are paid as equal to the paying services so our paying is also increasing so when you take the process in the hospital i'm sure it's uh, 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 everywhere it's the same no uh, one is the footprint related to access how are they getting into the facility so today morning when we drive in we see no terrific traffic no uh, saturday sunday i didn't see anybody on the road today morning it was every signal uh, alan had to wait and said two minutes will be there two minutes will be there <laughs> so there is a uh, way you have to access the care and then there is a footprint related to diagnosis and advice there's a footprint related to treatment and more importantly the footprint related to follow up care which is very important sometimes we can treat but some of the chronic diseases need regular follow ups they have to come back 3 months 6 months for visual fields or lasers or whatever be the care so there is a significant footprint in follow up care and uh, these are all important when we see transport of staff visitors patients even the transport of suppliers how are they getting the goods inside into the system procurement of goods and services how are we using the energy and more importantly what are we doing with the waste so when we take what happens at arvind so the one thing which we have tried always to reduce the carbon footprint in access is we made the access pretty long time so the hospital is open from 7 am to 6 pm so the registration starts at 7 am and closes at 5 30 pm so even if we have to close the clinic by 637 we still do a basic examination and give them a follow up and uh, for any general problems it's a non appointment system somebody walks in and wants a primary care like in the form of they want glasses or they they have a foreign body or they have a red eye it's usually non appointment system only review or any procedures would be appointment system and they come back for a follow up for a visual fields or a oct or they come back for a, a incision and curettage or a laser procedure then it's appointment otherwise it's usually a non appointment system and even if somebody fails an appointment walks into it we still see it's like getting into the class after 7 <laughs> what is the point in saying i can't see you you know, you, have, you have missed the appointment he has to again travel back home and he has to travel again for another appointment day so let's see him so that's how our system works and we do all care primary secondary and tertiary care so this is just to show you the flow of uh, uh, patients in the system from uh, 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 the patients are registered and at every step they are escorted to uh, the next step uh, the next step would be 
auto refraction and then our optometrist would do a regular uh, manual refraction then their intraocular pressure is uh, checked they uh, this is a kind of opportunistic screening where most of the patients above the age of 40 we do blood pressure and also make sure uh, we assess their blood sugar and then the preliminary examination is done and uh, dilatation and all the procedures rest of it is done before the final and then uh, the patients are escorted to either pharmacy optical or if they need surgery to the patient educators or counselors or if they need some specialty care they are escorted to the specialty clinic so we try to do this all in two hours time in the non-appointment so we have a system to track when the patient has registered entered into a clinic and from that point we make sure that all the test whatever you see here is completed in two hours see that's the commitment we want to give for anybody who walks into the system and how do we know the load we know the load from our previous five years experience so we have a AI in place or we have a diary which our patient educators prepare every year where for today so today is a pre-festival day in in uh, Pondicherry and Tamil Nadu Diwali the previous day tomorrow is Diwali which is Tuesday morning so we know the expected outpatients is going to be 300 or 400 not the 1200 which we normally get so so we have a plan for that for the whole year so we know when the holidays are <coughs> like your Thanksgiving, Christmas, you know, when we have quarterly and halfly holidays or annual holidays in summer between April and May, we have the maximum load of patients. So we know across that week what is our expected outpatient and expected cataract surgery, but not other specialties, at least expected cataract. So this allows us to kind of plan ourselves the previous day or for the whole week. You know, we advise doctors not to take uh, a leave on that week or unless it's an emergency, and we request all the team to be available, even the uh, non-clinical team to support the clinical team, you know, in helping in registration and escorting and things like that. So several things like that happen. Basically, again, you know, to, to meet that volume uh, wherever it is needed. So one person does one task, and there is an effective utilization of the equipments, either be a Humphrey field analyzer, or a OCT, or a laser machine, it will be optimally used. Like, for example, my Humphrey, there are two Humphrey field analyzers in glaucoma clinic in Pondicherry, four in Madurai, and more depending on the volume. But each machine will be optimally utilized. You know, they'll be noted down what time they started a patient, what time they finished, and then the next time when they started. So, roughly, they can come, they normally do 15 visual fields to 20 visual fields with one machine in a day. The same for two machines. Same way, any equipment. We know exactly you know, how many patients they would normally use. And if it is less, probably the reason is there were not appointments or the OP was significantly less on those days. <coughs> so when we talk again about access, so we did a lot of outreach over the years where the people uh, had to come to a, a, a kind of a campsite. So where our team goes and sets up a clinic and then the patients come to the campsite and they are examined. So this camp happens once in three months, once in six months, in some places, even once in a year. So people were waiting for accessing to these eye camps. So there was a lot of delay in treatment, and uh, we were not very happy with the way uh, the quality of workup also was in eye camp. There were a lot of reasons, the crowd in the camp, the <clears throat> limited time to do examination, uh, unavailability of uh, uh, technology to examine the patient. So. So we started uh, uh, vision centers. I'll just show you what uh, vision center does. So this is a vision center, which is uh, uh, around 40 kilometers from Pondicherry. So there are 10 centers with Pondicherry and totally now 72 centers uh, across uh, Tamil Nadu and Pondicherry. So basically there are two uh, staff who are working here. One is a patient educator who takes care of uh, uh, the pharmacy, the electronic medical record, and the other one is a technician who is trained to do optometry, refraction services, and also basic eye examination. So they do basic eye examination, they do the blood pressure, whatever I, I said in the OP happens here for the patient, and, uh, and they also take beautiful images of the fundus, you know, after dilatation, or even in some cases, non-metriatic way also the camera can take. 
and then every patient has got a personal consultation with a physician who is usually a third year resident in the base hospital so like uh, each uh, uh, doctor will have five centers connected and they will do only that work for that whole month so they'll be posted again somebody else would come up and do that job so that this is one way they learn how to manage a clinic also so they do teleconsultation and then the patients are offered most of the 90% of the problems are solved there 10% who need referrals for surgery or some other procedures are referred to the base hospital so so this is uh, one way we reach patient the other one is the camp and in camp only the cataract patients are transported so if you if you if you if you say a, a camp where we see normally 300 outpatients there will be 75 to 100 inpatients who are coming in on a weekend so they will they will be coming in two buses so if, if we didn't do that you now they will be traveling in different modes of travel to reach the hospital so that would again kind of you know increase the carbon footprint in their access so we now understand that even by doing outreach and transporting them as a group in big buses we are helping the environment and then after the surgery we are dropping them back at the camp site and then review camp is held at the camp site or in the vision center nearest vision center so they don't have to come back to a base hospital for a follow up after a month or 6 weeks or whatever period you want to see them back so we go to the camp site a small team goes and then they examine them there give them glasses so these are some of the uh, centers you know where they are located around the tertiary care center this is around madurai around tirunelveli around coimbatore around pondicherry so so this pocket is still empty so i was just telling uh, alan that we are going to start a new hospital in tanjavur by 2020 so which will have uh, vision centers around it and then the whole of tamil nadu would be covered so our idea is to have 200 vision centers and wean off all our eye camps and make sure within a 5 to 10 km radius they will have a good eye care they can uh, they can go to a vision center or a community center or to one of the uh, tertiary care centers mm-hmm. so they don't have to go beyond 5 to 10 km so that's the aim for 2030 so by 2025 we are going to have 150 vision centers and by 2020 we will have 200 centers covering almost the whole tamil nadu and pondicherry so now we are seeing close to a half a million patients in these vision centers so this is the uh, data for 67 vision centers uh, to 17 and 18 almost uh, uh, more than half a million patients we are seeing through these vision centers so these are people who are living in that same town or same village so they are just going and assessing a care uh, without much of a traveler so average of about 2000 visits a day so this is again to show you a little bit more on the Uh, details we are giving close to 86000 uh, glasses or spectacles to these outpatients and uh, the best part is you know the the glass acceptance usually in an outreach it is only 50% when you go to a camp and give them glasses if you give 100 only 50 of them buy the other 50 don't buy but here the acceptance is almost 90% so the the major issues are refractory error and cataract and all the other conditions to follow so if we can do this in a better way so that is what we are able to achieve through this vision centers and the cataract surgery advised if you see it's only 25000 this is because still there are camps happening around the centers so people prefer to go to an eye <coughs> camp for a surgery than a vision center for a simple reason is that they are being transported to the base hospital they are being followed up at the camp site so if they come to a vision center and they are referred for a surgery they have to travel on their own so there is a travel cost there is an uh, attender which they have to take and lot of other costs related to food and things like that so still people prefer to go to a camp but i am sure these numbers will increase once we start weaning off the camps this is just to show you a very recent change which we did to reduce uh, carbon footprint so what happens is in a vision center uh, the patient chooses a frame and the frame is sent to the central lab in one of the tertiary care centers so there is a two days which is involved in this and also you know taking this frame and giving it uh, uh, there was a carbon footprint and there was a cost also involved and then lab fits the lens and then another two days for the glass to be completed and again to reach the vision center so if you take totally you know it was like 5 plus days for the patient to get 
again, this was a reason or a barrier for some of the acceptance. You know, when you say four or five days, they say, no, I'll, I'll try somewhere else. You know? Then what we did was re we revisited it and we said, well, no, why don't we go online? Send uh, the frame details by email. You know, whatever he has selected, the image of that or the number of that frame is, is sent uh, by email to the uh, central lab. And the lab fits the lens in the, on the same day. When you send it, it's done on the same day. And within a day, now it comes back to the vision center. So now from like uh, four or five days, now it's become two days. So by this, the acceptance went from 70, 75% to 90% now. So there are things which keep, we constantly revisit and make changes which are patient friendly. And now we understand that it is environmental friendly also. No? So, so I, think, I think that is where we are making more profits again. So the acceptance, when it goes from 75 to 90%, your profits also go up. So this is uh, to show you some other ways of screening. So when there is uh, patients cannot access for a DR care, so now we are putting up cameras in primary health centers, which are uh, related to government and also in diabetic clinics where they don't have facility for uh, retinal examination because it's so important we need to take care of the retina in these patients. They just take care uh, of the diabetes and they prescribe medications. But normally they come weekly one day to collect the medications in primary health center where it is given free medications are given. So we have trained the nurses there and uh, uh, we have these low cost funders cameras and these images are, uh, are taken and then sent to the reading center and then we are giving uh, uh, reports immediately to them so that they, they, they have an additional care now and these patients need not uh, travel all the way to any eye care facility. So when it comes to uh, diagnosis and advice, no, it's, the system is designed and it allows all the investigations to be done on the same day. If somebody wants a cataract surgery and he walks in today, Monday, and if he's ready, he'll be operated Tuesday, unless there is a contraindication, maybe ocular or systemic, or he's on antiplatelet, or he needs some other cardiologist fitness and things like that. If he's a normal patient, healthy adult, no, well-controlled diabetes, hypertension. Usually, if he's prepared, the next day he's operated. He's not shortlisted or he's not given a waiting list or an appointment for a month or two months for a surgery. So, so if most of the uh, uh, investigations are done in the same day, even if a diabetic, uh, uh, a proliferative retinopathy or a severe non-proliferative, if he's, if he's already prepared you know, for a fluorazine or a laser or something like that, it's also done on the same day, preferably, or maybe the, uh, the immediate next day if he's ready to wait. So there is no waiting period for most of the procedures. So in the treatment also, we try to complete the care in a day or in the visit, like as I said before, uh, if he needs uh, any lasers or injections uh, for uh, Avastin or some other lucentis or injections like that, even then it is done on the same day. And 85 to 90 percent of the spectacles are also delivered on the same day. So all the tertiary care centers have uh, state-of-art labs uh, set up by SLR, and then they can grind and make sure the glasses are delivered in a couple of hours. So they give the prescription, they take the order, they go and have a coffee or a lunch, and they come back and they collect the spectacles and leave, so that they don't have to travel again back to get the spectacles. And patients who are advised for surgery are also, if they are ready for admission, if they are coming from a far off distance, they get admitted, otherwise they come as daycare the next day. So one uh, uh, area which I touched upon to begin with is again, the cataract surgery and the large carbon footprint. You know? So <coughs> high energy consumption, a lot of uh, capital equipments and surgical instruments and a uh, lot of disposables used you know, for each and every uh, surgery. And there is a complex waste which is generated. And, uh, and also there is a lot of water usage for uh, uh, sterilization and washing and all other uh, aspects which are related to surgery. So just to show you how uh, the uh, system which we follow, this is, this is the patients after 
no, in the morning, uh, these, these are charitable patients. So you can see this kind of assembly line and each one will be doing and the task will be shifted to the next area. So the eyes are marked, cleaned, and then they go to sub -tenons. So we have trained residents or uh, senior staff doing the sub -tenons. And after that, you know, the OT store nurse barcodes and then gives the lens uh, uh, to the patient. And once the patient is uh, on the table, they are usually guided by the running nurses inside the operating room. There will be two running nurses for the single surgeon and two uh, assisting nurses like this. So you can see there are two tables. The surgeon would move on from one table to the other table. By the time he finishes this case, the next case will be prepped and ready for surgery. So, so by this, we are able to kind of maximize you know, the, the surgeon's productivity in the operating room. And also, we, we try to maintain a very high uh, safety and quality standards. So just to show how, uh, by just increasing the number of tables and the nurses, uh, the productivity of a surgeon goes up. See, normally when you have one table, one nurse assisting, and then the patient has to go in, come out inside, you know, even the best of the surgeon would take 45 minutes to an hour. So that is how most of the time, it's not the surgeon is not skilled or the system is not efficient, but the way how we do. So, so here you see, uh, by the time you, you finish a case, then it will be so orchestrated. So now exactly at what step that pay, next patient will be on table and then it will be prepared. Uh, the speculum will be applied. Uh, if it's a small incision, they'll put a bridal suture for you and then keep it ready so that you go ahead on the other side and you, you start the next case. So you don't re-gown and re-glove between cases? Yeah. So we, we use an antiseptic solution on the glove, and for every 10th patient, we change the glove. So that's a standard procedure we follow. So this is uh, uh, just to show you the productivity of an eye surgeon at Aravind. It will be close to 2,000 surgeries, and the national average is less than uh, 400. So, the, so coming back to your question, now this is what uh, uh, we do, a lot of uh, sharing of supplies. Uh, minimal use of single-use instruments, reuse of single-use instruments with uh, very strict sterilization protocols. They are fresh sterilized and they come back um, for use. And a, lo a lot of time goes into supply chain management and uh, waste segregation and uh, our policy of reducing and also recycling and reusing certain things which can be reused. So just to give you an understanding of what a life cycle assessment is when you take a, a, a chocolate like this no how do you get the chocolate no uh, it's, it's so complex no from feeding a racing cow milking it pasteurizing transporting the milk and then sugar cane cocoa and finally no all these come and then there is a manufacturing of chocolate which happens so this is the upstream and then the downstream now, after we eat the chocolate, you know, the, the paper which it is wrapped goes again uh, uh, for uh, disposal. Now, again, all this have to be see where it is going. So any anything like this, whether it be our cassettes, either be our tubings, either be our knives or blades, whatever we use, has got this life cycle. And we need to see how much of energy, how much of water, how much of transportation is going into all this to reach us and then how much of again energy we're going downstream to get rid of all this waste. So that's uh, more about the inputs and the outputs uh, which we see. So just to show you what happens in our system, the surgery dress and gowns at the end of the session, they go for uh, washing, drying and then CSSD. The, the trays and pans at the end of the session, again, they go for full cycle. In between, they are all flashed. The surgical instruments are all flashed. And the end of the day, they go for the central sterilization, which is full cycle. Surgical gloves disposed after eight to 10 cases. <coughs> and in between, we use an antiseptic made by Orolab, which is chlorexidine gluconate. So you apply that, and then you do the surgeries. And at the end of uh, 10 cases, it goes to biomedical waste. IV syringes, end of every case, to biomedical waste. And same way, any sharps, needles, and blades, end of every case, it goes for uh, a puncture-proof container, biomedical waste. And cotton swab, gauze, whatever used for that particular case, goes to, again, biomedical waste. And the plastic drapes, packing materials are disposed. 
and then they go for recycle and they are also sold. And we make a significant money by reselling many of these plastic drapes and packing materials. And medicine and consumable containers, again, are disposed. I think this video ran actually, but this is just to show you what happens in the morning. So how meticulously plastic and paper is separated at source, you know, which is very important. So all these are knives and blades you know, when they come with a cover. So that's, that's what she's doing. She's collecting all that and then separating the paper. The knives are already removed and it's on the table. So what they do is if I'm going to do 20 fakers, they will take 20 knives and keep it ready in the morning. So these are all the boxes where the knives the uh, your cartridges and all that are stored and that at the end of the day they'll go into that container so it makes the job very simple for them in segregation of waste at source which is very very important so this is just to show you the uh, uh, this is in kgs actually the the weight of uh, the disposables which we are collecting these are the resaleable waste so the paper waste uh, the polythene the containers which you use big glass bottles uh, lens covers, plastic paper, <coughs> cardboards which uh, come in packing material. So they all go for sale to the scrap vendor. So we're generating uh, uh, money from this waste because it is properly segregated at source. Initially, when we are not segregating it properly, we are not able to do this. Or somebody was segregating in a different place, which can again be a safety hazard. So now. We made it a mandatory for the last many years. We are doing a segregation at source so that at the end of the day, you have something like this and it can be very optimally sold to the scrap vendors. Here's something which you are familiar of. There's a picture taken in Kellogg, but still I think it's the same here, right? At one FACO case at US and this is 100 plus FACO cases at Arwin. This is the end of the day. So this. Uh, uh, image was also, we, we, we published this work uh, some time back on the carbon footprint of an average single FACO at Arvind and in UK. So, so this is a UK study you know, which is showing you 120 plus carbon equivalents and uh, in Arvind uh, it's like running 25 kilometers. Do you want to run 500 kilometers or 25 kilometers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need to revisit a lot of things for that. So lower the amount of waste produced, you know, we're trying to reduce and uh, um, this is what uh, we published in this work on cataract surgery and environmental sustainability. It was a very good work done by Casey Thale. She was a Fulbright fellow and I met her in one of the ARVO meetings at Fort Lauderdale and uh, she said she's working on hysterectomy surgeries. I said, you're an environmental engineer, what are you doing with hysterectomy? She said, my area is waste management. No, I, I see the amount of waste we generate. I said cataract surgery is the maximum done across the world. Why don't we work on that? And that's how this work started. And she came and spent six months with us in Pondicherry. And uh, this work was widely covered in US media also. Uh, in many of the US media saying you know, how much of uh, waste is generated for one FACO surgery. And we, I would say, you know, we, are, we carefully reuse a lot of things like uh, uh, like Prof was asking about the glove, we, we have several publications to uh, reinstate the statement that uh, nowhere it has affected or compromised the safety or um, the infection or related tasks or things related to cataract surgery. So this is one of the big series we published again from Pondicherry looking at a year performance, you know, 42,000 surgeries uh, and, and the endophthalmitis rate was 0.07. And after starting to use the intracameral moxifloxacin in the last three years, it has come down to 0 0.02 now from 0 0.07, which is like one in 20,000. So there's a significant reduction in endophthalmitis even by reusing uh, many of these uh, things uh, and uh, disposing it at the end of the day. So recycle, as I said, no, we are sending it to the scrap for uh, recycling because of very effective segregation of waste. And this is very important. We were briefly touching yesterday also on this about repairing or the instrument maintenance. How when uh, many of you travel to Africa, you see a lot of beautiful equipments just lying in a corner. Beautiful microscopes, machines, FACO machines or uh, laser machines. Just because one IC is gone or the bulb is not available, 
So we have a very uh, important department called Instrument Maintenance Department. There are very few biomedical engineers, but a lot of technicians trained to repair ophthalmic equipments. Mm -hmm. So they are there in all the tertiary care hospitals. And uh, what they do is they do a lot of preventive maintenance. So every Sunday they go around oiling the slit lamps, making sure the joystick works perfectly, making sure the, uh, the, the uh, dust is cleaned on the mirror so that you don't have breakdown maintenance. So what happens is once you, there is a breakdown, your efficiency goes down. You know, you're wasting a lot of time on that. So there is a lot of carbon footprint in getting somebody from Topcon or Zeiss or Alcon to come and fix it. But if you can do preventive maintenance in regular intervals, I'm sure the people are ready to teach, but they will not teach unless we ask them, because they are not interested. They are ready to change a part, but we'll have to make sure that it doesn't go. So some of our slit lamps, you know, the, the first slit lamp we are changing is after 15 years in Pondicherry, the Topcon SL1E. You know, we are, we are not in fact condemning, so we are trying to remove some parts and use it in some other slit lamps. But this is the first time we have purchased four slit lamps after 15 years in Pondicherry to replace four worn out slit lamps. And all the Zeiss microscopes are still doing well. They, the ones we got to begin with are still doing well. Same way uh, the FACO machines. But FACO machines now, because the technology is changing, they are replacing it. So they are removing it and then they are replacing it. But a lot of other things has got a pretty long life at Aravind because we do a very good instrument maintenance. And we train a lot of people in this instrument maintenance from across the globe. And uh, finally, uh, though this, uh, this is the fifth R I like, is to rethink. No, uh, so uh, this is a box where our uh, auto view lens comes. So this box is used in the coffee shop to take coffee cups. So if you want to take multiple coffee cups, so they use this. No, it's like a, a stand to hold that. So after that only it is disposed again to plastic and then it goes for resale. So you need to rethink you know, a lot of things. How many of you get what this is? Any idea what this is? A light bulb. Yes. yes. It's the light bulbs from uh, your Zeiss microscopes or water microscopes. So the light bulbs become beautiful flower vases. Okay, so housekeeping department hunt for all these things and they make sure before you dispose it, you throw it, they'll take a look and they'll say, okay, I can use this safely, then they use it, otherwise then it goes for dispose. The same way even some of the uh, four shops when they become blunt, they are used in the OPD to pick up the wiper or cotton and things like that. They're just not thrown away because you can't hold your conjunctiva, it doesn't mean that four shops has been condemned. So there's got another role for it to play. So you, you reuse and rethink about it till the end of the life cycle. So we also promote like this, you know, to reduce uh, the resources, lot of follow-up in uh, vision centers. This is one thing which we did again very recently in Pondicherry. For the last five months, we have been doing it. And this is a three-month data, you know, where we never thought about doing this. For, for a lot of time in the meaning because we were doing daycare and the patients were coming back to the base hospital. And one of uh, uh, the patient asked me, uh, doctor, can I, can I see in this vision center? I said, why? Because I live in the same building. I have rented the property for the vision center. I said, we have never thought about it, no? The nearest vision centers, even they have daycare procedures, the people were coming back to the base hospital for review. And uh, that started this uh, new system of finding out the nearest vision center. So when you enter a, a, a town or a village, it will say that this center is much closer than coming to a base hospital. So we have a program now, and the patient educators enter the, the place of uh, uh, where the residence is, and then it will say, if you go to this center, vision center, it's much easier than coming to the base hospital the next day morning. So now we are encouraging this, and interestingly now we see almost 19% going to the vision centers. This is a three month data where you see 19% of them going to vision centers. 13% going to our city center in Pondicherry, and 68% uh, are still coming back to the base hospital because that is the nearest point for them. And uh, we have made posters uh, like this to encourage patients now for them to engage. You know, the patient itself, I want them to ask. So can I see my review on first day at this vision center? So we have made some posters to engage the patients now. 
So this is what I, I told you in the beginning, see how we bring uh, uh, patients from our outreach. So this is how they come, you know, in buses. So around 58 people can come in the bus like this, and then they, they go back like this. You know? <laughs> and then you go back and review them. Uh, and uh, this is one interesting point, you know, which is, is there across all Aravin, except in Madurai. 50% of the staff live within the campus, you know, and we walk to the care uh, building, I mean to the hospital. You know, we walk like this. <laughs> no, not getting into traffic. So there are two uh, advantages. One is reducing the carbon footprint. Second is you make sure they are in time yeah, uh, right. uh, for work, <laughs> as early as 7 o'clock in the OR and 7.30 in the OPD. <laughs> So just, I started this with uh, uh, some of the other aspects which we do towards environment, and this we have been doing for quite some time, especially the, uh, the DWATS plant which we have uh, for wastewater treatment, uh, the solar plant which we have installed in all the Arvins in the last five years, now Pondicherry got this three years back. Um, the garden and vegetation, which fortunately for Pondicherry, I, I'm not saying that it happens everywhere in Arvind, but fortunately because we have a beautiful land and this land was agricultural land no we are still doing agriculture there you no know, with the balanced land which is available behind the campus which you see and uh, when you come to energy efficiency i think uh, you know, I were, even today morning i was saying uh, salt lake was much better if you go to many of the cities in us all the lights are on right even after they leave the office all the buildings are on, all the shop lights are on. No, we really don't understand why. No, is it for safety or is it for showing how your office is beautiful in the night? No, even sometimes, no, I, uh, in Ann Arbor, my wife was trying to uh, do shopping and then she went to an art gallery. She was seeing a lot of things. Then we went for dinner. We came back and the light was still on. So she thought that shop is still open to get that small necklace or something. Since she walked inside and it says closed. I said, it's here, all the lights are on, don't worry, we'll, we'll see how we we'll switch it off later. But, but I think it's very important now how we brainstorm our team to be efficient in all this, now how our team thinks. Uh, uh, so back at home, only uh, key areas are air conditioned. And uh, uh, recently, in the last four or five years, again, we have changed all our lights to LED and uh, very effective utilization of equipments like what you're seeing and uh, preventing a lot of breakdown. And, uh, even educating our staff and patients about electricity and uh, uh, usage of electricity, how they can uh, uh, minim minimize it, uh, effective instrument and main electricity maintenance, and also uh, installation of clean energy like solar. So we're looking at energy efficiency. So this is uh, 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 the plant you know, which gives you a daily uh, calculation of how much of savings. So since we did this uh, as of 30th June 2018, the financial savings is 6.2 lakhs. This is six months for me. In 2018, mm -hmm. so I'm saving six lakh Indian rupees on electricity by having the solar because almost 50 to 60 percent of the uh, uh, energy which is we conserve, I mean, we use is coming from our solar plant. So, so that is where you can make profits also. And uh, regarding food, I, uh, uh, we have these beautiful gardens where we do everything, but also we try to. Uh, educate our staff, you know, our nurses, even our patients. And like you can see this poster in, uh, in our canteen saying, you know, uh, yesterday so many kgs of food was wasted and uh, uh, this can feed 50 people or 60 people. So just kind of, you know, kind of uh, brainstorming and the importance of food and wastage. And water, in addition to the uh, decentralized treatment plant, um, we do a lot of rainwater harvesting and we also try to reduce water consumption by using some efficient taps and things like that and also waterless <coughs> toilets. But I think the most important part is high level of commitment from our leadership, uh, raising uh, staff awareness and engaging the staff in whatever activities we do, either be recycle or rethinking. You no, know, they should they should understand what is this frugality in Arvind. It's not being stingy. It's being friendly to the environment. You no, know, and being efficient in whatever we do, and identifying and implementing new opportunities. You know, wherever we get, 
And uh, also, we want to take this message forward, and that's the idea of uh, making this presentation. And with IAPB, we had a beautiful workshop in September called I Care Delivery and Environmental Impact, where a lot of uh, NGO hospitals from India and a few other Southeast Asian countries were also there. And we, this was the message we gave them, rethink green, be the change, solutions for sustainable eye care. And uh, we also want to take this forward. So it's a systems issue, right? <laughs> so that's what uh, we see daily uh, in the operating rooms here. Electricity, capital goods, disposable, single-use materials uh, for ophthalmic surgery. You know, there are so many drapes covering the whole body, and the, every staff has to change their dress and come back. So that is where we are going to travel 500 kilometers for every FACO case. So if we can even reduce 50 kilometers in that, or Jeff, even if you reduce 50 kilometers, I'm still, uh, uh, it's possible with all your uh, regulations and uh, uh, reimbursement processes. Thank you. Yeah. So one thing that's always struck me about Aravind is how uh, socially, uh, I guess the so social responsibility has been such a primary driver. And, and I recognize how unique that is. And then also now to see environmental responsibility being a, a, a core mission, a core driving value. And, and it seems, I guess the question for me is, how do you create such a strong culture where that becomes the norm for everyone when it's not the norm? And, and how do you maintain that? That's a good question, but a very tricky and a difficult question. But the simple answer is, anybody at Arvind is trained at Arvind. So that's one thing which really you know, helps us to take this culture and value along. They either be you know, frugality or uh, there are seven pillars. I'll talk to you about that later for the Arvind culture to stay stronger and uh, continue the legacy. The thing is, when I come into Arvind, I didn't come from Shankar Netralia or LV Prasad or some from Medical College in Bombay. So I joined as a resident. Then I was groomed there. And now I'm at a certain position. Same way, MLOP comes from school, she does the training, and then she continues. Same way our fellows from different colleges, they have to do a fellowship at Arvind. And at the end of two years, you decide whether you are suitable for this organization, you want to continue or not. Or else you leave the organization after your training. I'm happy. You did a good residency. You completed your exams. OK, I'll give you a certificate, and you can leave. There are somebody who I think will be groomed into this organization, then I open up an option for him to be a consultant and continue. So it happens on either side. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the positive which we have. So everybody comes straight. See, that is where we are able to bring efficiency in any procedures we do also. Everybody will do the same way. If it is small incision, no, everybody will do with the Simco, with the Rexis, no, with the same uh, Indo-German or Kosla or whatever. But whereas if you see other systems, everyone will say, I want this instrument, I want this knife, I want this keratome. It doesn't happen there. So. Yeah. <clears throat> that, that question is part of the general problem of how you affect disruptive innovations as opposed to sustaining innovations. This is a disruptive innovation, and uh, exactly. uh, it, it takes a break from ordinary activities. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for this comprehensive view. I have two questions. The first is just rhetorical. So the first question is, will you run uh, to be president of India? Uh, and the second question, uh, because it sounds to me like you could do an awfully good job for that country. Uh, the second question has to do with waste, uh, which I want to discuss with you after the meeting. Uh, <clears throat> because the waste is one of the ways you protect the planet. Uh, and I'm wondering if you think we can really protect the planet, or this is just a stopgap measure until we destroy the planet. <laughs> and uh, with regard to waste, 
uh, I'd like to uh, just mention that you have not talked about waste associated with medical decision making. And the Institute of Medicine uh, estimates in the United States, and it appears to be true also in Canada, that somewhere between one third and perhaps a little more than one half of uh, medical care we deliver is either unnecessary or ineffective. So maybe we could talk about that uh, after. But th this was just, just a wonderful overview. Thank you. Thank you. And you should, uh, uh, you should mention, uh, in terms of that, the, 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 the Google uh, capabilities now. Google has, I don't know if you have that slide up, but <coughs> they can they can take a photograph You know about this, Randy? I don't know if you know about this. You mentioned it to me earlier. So this is a beautiful picture now which talked about what is statistics and what is artificial intelligence. <laughs> it's like your house now. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you put a nice frame over the switch box, yeah. Yeah, then it becomes artificial intelligence. Sorry, yeah. When you say only statistics, data, no, it's, it, nobody comes to that. Once you say artificial intelligence, people throng around it. So while you're getting that, I just want to give a, <clears throat> a, a little different take on the future. Uh, I'm not a pessimist, I'm an optimist. Uh, and, and I think that what we're going to find is, is that a, a lot of the things we're concerned about now are, are going to transition surprisingly naturally. I mean, once the break point comes, <clears throat> and we have the battery storage in which there's already technology out there that can do it, in which our, our cost per, per kilowatt hour storage, you know, per, per kilogram is, is dramatically less than what it is now. And, and there's already technology to cut that down uh, to a fifth of what it is today. And uh, it, it's just simply much less expensive. I, I think things can naturally transition, just like the Malthusian risk in regards to uh, the number of new people on the earth, which it proposed, has dropped dramatically, mainly because once people get a little better education and once things move along, the birth rate starts dropping dramatically. And there are large areas of the world where, frankly, their biggest concern is, is if they're not producing enough babies, and, and, and uh, particularly in the Western world, and, and their populations are going to start dropping dramatically. The, the one exception so far has been Africa in that, which continues to, to not follow that general model. But yeah. India has dropped dramatically in birth rate. Um, Asia has dropped dramatically. So these, these things tend to come along. And, and one thing to think about is, is that just think of yourself as a health <coughs> officer in New York City in 1895. So what was your single overwhelming concern in 1895? Infection, public health. No, no. I'm talking about. I'm talking about trying to deal with 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 these kind of issues. It was horse manure. Horse manure was an overwhelming problem. The city was growing. Everybody had to have a set of horses, and the the amount of horse manure was filling in about ten city blocks, about fifty feet high. And it was a horrible <clears throat> health issue. With you know, 1895, you knew about infectious diseases, the rats and the rest. They were talking about how this is impossible and the rest. And yet, you know, even though it's created its own problems, the rapid uptake of internal combustion engines has completely eliminated that problem in 20 minutes. So I, I just want to be out there. I, I think that you're going to be surprised at, at how fast a lot of things change. There's, there's already now ceramic tiles that also function as... Uh, that have a, a thin coat could be put on them, and already are solar collectors and solar panels. Uh, there's things on the outside I mean, that that could become made standard in, in, in a relatively short period of time. I think that the, the transition will be breathtakingly rapid, and we will see, and I think you will see the day, I might not live to see the day, because I'm an old fart, but you younger people, I think you'll see the day in which the idea that you're burning hydrocarbon to produce energy will seem incredibly savage and, and, old, and old, can't imagine, you know, that that was something that was done. So 
a, a lot needs to change, and we could help it by what we do, but I just want people to know that, that personally, I, I think these transitions can, can happen relatively, relatively rapidly. The biggest thing that holds us back now, and we can already do a lot in regards to the latest in solar, is our storage capacity. And uh, you can already get a lithium battery that it increases its overall uh, storage density, that's how much it can store per kilogram, fivefold, but that you get rapid temperature changes, and those rapid temperature can cause fires. But uh, uh, there's new technology that can, can overcome that. Uh, and it's, it's already been proof tested in small areas. So I, 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 I think this is the kinds of things we need to do. I will also point out for us, the United States, <coughs> and much of the Western world, it would, re it would require a profound regulatory change to get anywhere close to where you are. Yes. But I think you're showing that these things are possible without the mar marked increase in infection disease and others is, is what will be required. But it's not just ophthalmology. For us not to have to change a, 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 you know, a, a gown and gloves and, and all the rest, between every case would be something you have to change, not just for us, we have to change you know, throughout all, all U.S. medicine. And that's a huge part of our disposable. And the fact that you reuse it, uh, Alan and I can remember days we used to reuse our drapes and the rest, which would, would be a huge profound saving. Uh, but, but sadly, because our labor costs are much more than yours are, uh, that makes it much more expensive. And so we need, we need to figure out ways how that we think about this in a, in a smarter way. And, yeah. and, down. But uh, um, there are countries already, I mean, the, the, the energy utilization and waste utilization of a country like Japan, which is doing, in a, of a developed country, is doing way, way better. I mean, they're getting along with doing this at about a third of what we're doing in the United States, for instance. So those are the kinds of changes and best practices that I think could really make a, a very dramatic change. Yeah, my, my <coughs> That's a very nice uh, Go ahead and run that. description. I just want to leave it on an atmosphere that we're all yeah. doomed and we're all going I, I think, to... I think, I think these changes are going to be amazingly rapid. <laughs> you know, a lot depends upon uh, how wealthy you are. I remember uh, following World War II, uh, living in Europe. In Europe, every light switch turned off automatically in the hallway. Every light switch and every air conditioner turned off automatically in a rented room, yeah. unless you put the card in that indicated you were there. The in the United States, you just heard that all lights were all yeah, over. The audio that that changes, and that, and, and of course, that's all. That's still the case in Europe. I spent a lot of my time in Sweden. Yeah, that's, that's all. Our new building in Mid Valley now closes down when the room's not occupied. Excellent. So the, the, the air conditioning and the airflow goes to ten percent. Lights turn off and turn back on. So slowly we're getting there. So I think a lot of people have to go. We're 10 after 8. No, this is a two second. I mean, this, no, this, is not a, this is not another talk. Yeah. How, how are you paying for the new hospital? It's all from the revenue generated from uh, the existing hospitals. So you're paying with private funds? Yes, entirely. No, no donations, no grants for starting new facilities. So and their model's been self-sustaining. That's also good. Yeah. So from a single, from a single uh, photograph, now Google can predict the age of the patient, the sex of the patient, well, well, allowing you to get it app. Whether they're into yeah. smoking or not yeah. smoking. The, the whole thing is going to happen with apps and other things like that moving forward. I'll give you a couple of examples today. Change how we provide health care. Yeah. And I want to give you a couple of examples today. Healthcare is one of the most important fields AI is going to transform. Last year, we announced a work on diabetic retinopathy, which is a leading cause of blindness, and we use deep learning to help doctors diagnose it earlier. And we've been running field trials since then at Aravind and Sankara hospitals in India, and the field trials are going really well. We are bringing expert diagnosis to places where trained doctors are scarce. It turned out, using the same retinal scans, there were things which humans quite didn't know to look for, but our AI systems offered more insights. Your same eye scan turns out holds information with which we can predict the five-year risk of you having an adverse cardiovascular event, heart attack or strokes. 
So to me, the interesting thing is that you know, more than what doctors could find in these eye scans, the machine learning systems offered newer insights. This could be the basis for a new non-invasive way to detect uh, cardiovascular risk. And we are working, we just published the research, and we are going to be working to bring this to field trials with our partners. And I want to get... Yeah. So it's like now you... Scratch on the surface. Of yeah. That. So you can know the age, the gender, the, whether he's a current smoker, HPA1C, BMI, systolic, diastolic blood pressure, all from a simple retinal image. Thank you. Thank you.